vi klar for tredje og siste bolk i dag. Eh, vi skal nå få litt inspiration fra det store utland. Og det betyr at jeg skal bytte over til engelsk. Um, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, we'll come in after the break. We're going to get some inspiration from two international speakers on the global trends in green building practices and how we can create healthier indoor environments in those places we're going to build or repurpose, so to speak. The first speaker up is James Drinkwater. Yes, it is his real name. He's <laughs> general director of the World uh, Green Building Council and their Europe network. I've also, since I've do been doing my job all day, uh, I've outsourced the introduction for the next speaker to James, and he's going to take it from here. Great. Thank you so much. <laughs> so we are at a global tipping point. It's a crucial moment in time. We just heard from the IPCC report, we have roughly 12 years to avoid going over that important 1.5 degrees. But I'm not talking about that tipping point, because I'm an optimist, and project fear is not useful if we want to get together and talk and act. I'm an optimist. I believe we're a tipping point, because since I started my career, and I was a banking lawyer in the banking sector, where we did a lot of talking about sustainable real estate, but it was really talk. When we got a green lease, we went, oh, that's interesting, and we crossed it out because it wasn't market standard. I think that's really shifted, and we're starting to see sustainability in the built environment, environment become a really mainstream issue. And I think there are some really key and big dynamics that is going to drive this market really across the mainstream globally in the coming years. And I want to share those with you. I am very proud to be part of a global family of green building councils. It's wonderful to be here with my, my colleagues from the Norwegian Green Building Council, who are part of this global coalition of green building councils in 70 countries across the world, uniting over 50,000 members to drive sustainable building. And we are driven by this belief, and it's wonderful to see this here today, that our sector is more or less unparalleled in its ability to help society deliver the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And we all know, and we've talked about, the wonderful economic, societal, and environmental benefits of doing this. But for me, the really key driver of all of this is to make sure that one day my walk to work doesn't look like this. And I joke a little, but I show images like this to remind us what 12 years to avoid 1.5 degrees really means. So what do I think are some of these really key tipping points, these key things that are happening that have changed since I started my career in green buildings? One of the major drivers we're going to hear a little bit about from the next speakers, it keys into people, which have always been at the heart of our built environment. Health and well-being are becoming one of the major demand drivers for sustainable buildings, which want, look, once looked at what the built environment could offer the natural environment, and now we're looking at what sustainable buildings can offer to people in terms of their performance, their lives, their productivity. I've also seen a shift since my time in the banking sector, and particularly since the Paris Agreement was agreed. And investors, the major institutionals for whom our asset class, real estate, is the most important asset class, start to say, we want to be part of the solution. This is a really critical trend I'm going to talk a little bit about. It's an important moment in time, and a shift which I think happened some time ago here in your market, but has happened across global markets since COP21, is that we've shifted beyond energy as the key metric to carbon, to a discussion from the discussion based on fuel and fuel crisis and the need to reduce energy, to really looking at this as a, a total emissions issue for the sector. And I want to turn to that first theme to start us off and talk about a project we launched in response to the Paris Agreement called Advancing Net Zero Buildings. I was in Paris when the agreement was struck, and a friend of ours from the US said, you, the Green Building Councils, are the global network who have to help industry drive towards the buildings we now need, net zero carbon buildings. 
And so we took on this challenge and launched a project called the Advancing Net Zero Project with a simple vision that by 2050, all buildings would operate at a net zero carbon level. And green building councils across the globe are working now with their government to establish ambitious policy to support this shift, to release certifications to drive ambitious building projects, on industry training programs to deliver the workforce we need and with corporate leaders to show what is possible. And excitingly, across the course of 2018, we've seen our colleagues from around the globe release this new set of market standards, net zero building certifications, to show what is considered Paris-proof in an era where we must meet the goals of that agreement. Each of these certification schemes is slightly different, but each adheres to this principle of energy efficiency first, followed by on-site and off-site renewables to ensure we hit net zero. And our hope over time is that we see a snowball effect, that through these certifications and demonstration projects, through the training programs and the policy work, we can start to see a snowball because the vision is not that we have thousands of these buildings, but that we have billions one day. Now, there are projects across the world that are showing how to make net zero carbon buildings a reality. The Barangaroo project in Australia is a carbon neutral precinct. Some of its key strategies are, for example, a district cooling system that provides air conditioning across all the buildings, so a centralized piece of infrastructure that actually creates huge energy and water savings. But this is a very high density development. And in terms of renewables, whilst the site's highly energy efficient, it can't get all of its needs from on-site solutions. But in terms of off-site renewables, every single building, small, large, has a role to play in this development. Annual greenhouse gas reporting and financial contributions to off-site renewable solutions means that actually every single building is accountable to help keep the site carbon neutral. This Nottingham UK project, part of the university there, was a carbon neutral project. The design team here set off with a carbon budget, and that carbon budget actually helped them define the parameters for every single design decision in the project. So this, is, this is building has an incredibly high performance facade, for example uses a lot of solar PV and a lot of passive design. So there are elements of the buildings, passive spaces that don't need heating or cooling throughout the year. And it has an incredibly high performance facade here. It was interesting, one of the, the products uh, that went into this building was from a German manufacturer. They were looking at the building performance and realized that the product they really wanted uh, for some of the cladding, it actually exceeded their carbon budget because of this twice-bake process that meant it exceeded the carbon budget. They went back to this German supplier and said, it exceeds our carbon budget. Can you look at this? The manufacturer realized that actually they could get the same performance results through a single-bake process. So that interplay actually helped the manufacturer deliver a, a new product, in essence, a higher performance product in terms of its life cycle carbon. Turning to the US now, the Bullet Foundation building is a living building challenge certified building net zero carbon, an office building which interestingly sets an energy budget for each of its tenants. And if they don't go over that, they actually don't pay an energy bill. Again, they started with this idea of an energy or a carbon budget. So they looked at what the, the generation capacity of the solar PV roof was, and then all the design decisions around the building were taken in response to that. So it's passive house standard. And I think one of the, the interesting, interesting little stories about this is to achieve air tightness to passive house standard, they had to source these windows from Germany that operate on, on four hinges. But actually, they realized that sourcing it from Germany would be against some of the rules in terms of the distance required for the living building challenge. So they went to that supplier again, talked to them. They then licensed that to a local US manufacturer who can now supply these high performance products in their local market. And these projects don't all have to be super cool and necessarily costly projects. Zero carbon buildings don't have to cost the earth. This is a fantastic project, 19 lead platinum buildings in Hawaii. But the nice thing here was that they were delivered for half the price of the average housing in their community. Strategy of energy efficiency and renewables getting them 
to zero carbon. But again, we have lots of these leadership examples, but we want to move from thousands to billions. So in San Francisco, at the Global Climate and Action Summit, with our Green Building Councils, we released a global commitment to net zero carbon buildings, inviting building, people from the building industry, our leaders, cities, states, and regions to come together and commit that by 2030, the buildings that they own and operate will become net zero carbon buildings. And for the cities, we asked them to commit that within, within the next few decades, up to 2050, all of their buildings will be net zero carbon. 22 of the world's megacities joined us. Mayors from the likes of Copenhagen, London, Paris, Stockholm, New York, Tokyo, and Cape Town. And businesses with revenues of over $22 billion have joined us in this commitment. But it's the start of the snowball effect. And so it's a challenge I'd lay down to those leaders in this room who'd like to commit with us. So to move to another key theme, and it's a theme that we've worked on in our Europe network for a number of years. It's a key issue for our region, creating a renovation revolution. Now, the Building Performance Institute Europe have come out with some stark facts. According to them, 97% of our buildings in Europe are not good enough in terms of Paris compliance. Our energy efficiency renovation rates to drive and decarbonize the building stock have to more than triple. And that means something like one and a half deep energy renovations every minute across Europe. Now, the EU for some time has had ambitious buildings policy, and there was a huge political debate over the last couple of years, which has released a new buildings directive with this vision that every country will have a national renovation strategy for a highly efficient and decarbonized building stock by 2050. And through some of our EU-funded programs, like the Build Upon campaign, we've been working tirelessly with green building councils and governments across the region to design long-term policy strategies and create the new business models we need for this renovation revolution. One of the critical challenges for us, and we've heard this several times today, is to bring together all the actors we need in this new renovation economy. And we've seen that the quality of collaborations, the breadth of partnerships, and particularly bringing together unusual partners, produces some of the best results. We ran a two-year campaign where 14 countries hosted over 100 events, brought together 2,000 organizations over those two years to help design these strategies. And for me, one of the projects, and we awarded this with a global prize recently, that, that speaks to this idea we need new partnerships is Energiesprong a deep renovation business model from the Netherlands. So in the Energy Sprong model, they create a new market. It's based in the social housing sector, and they identified in their first, the first tranche of this program 100,000 properties in the social housing sector that needed renovating with specific design parameters. And in creating that pipeline of projects, it meant that product and solution providers weren't just providing their stuff to a project, they were actually innovating for a new market. Dutch legislation allows the social housing sector to pay for the capital costs of these renovation programs over time by taking back money from the savings on the energy bill of these properties. And the supply chains come together to create volume innovations, things like prefabricated facades, new roofs with solar panels inbuilt, and through things like building information modeling, and again, this prefabricated, industrialized model, they're trying to make getting a net zero renovation as easy as going out to buy a new kitchen. Because it has to be easy, it has to be affordable, it has to be quick for consumers. And you can see one of their first prototypes here. This took two weeks, this first project, to get to net zero levels. They got it down to a week. And again, with these efficiencies, they've got it down to net zero in one day. It's a really impressive model, but it works very well for the social housing sector. It's being rolled out in other countries. What about all those single family homes that need to get renovated? Where are the incentives? Where are the right business models to get them started? Well, mortgages, and we've heard the financial sector is moving, they underpin about a third of the total assets of the financial sector across Europe. We are fundamental as a sector. Property is fundamental to the banking sector. And a few of us got to thinking, people take out a mortgage when you move to a property. What if preferential and better mortgage conditions could be offered 
to consumers who are going to improve the efficiency of their property. Now, this is not a new idea. It's happening. But it's about how do we move this from niche to mass market? Now, we know one thing is very true. Inefficient buildings, because of tighter regulation, shifting consumer preference and costs, represent a risk on the balance sheet of every mortgage bank. We're starting to see this shift now. But equally, there are great benefits to be had, both for banks and borrowers, to investing in more efficient buildings. A lower probability of default. We've seen research in my home, the UK, come out to show that A-rated properties typically have a lower rate of mortgage default than others because of their efficiency, their lower cost basis. We've also started to see in a number of markets a shift in value. Or we heard from the French government in Brussels the other day that their lowest rating properties are being discounted as, at as much as 10%. So again, we're shielding against risk here. But why haven't green mortgages become a really big thing across Europe? Well, there's a lack of awareness, both in banks and in terms of the consumer. And part of this is down to, for the banking sector, a lack of a standardized definition. This is something they're really seeking for. And also that coordinated action, this partnerships point. We are not coming together with our colleagues in the banking sector, the construction sector, the energy sector, and importantly, the valuation professions to build this new market for green mortgages. But we've been working tirelessly for the last few years with 10 of the green building councils in Europe and recently published a report that sets out a vision of how we take this to a mass market. It proposes to the banking sector a new market standard and definition for green mortgages and calls for the partnerships needed to launch this and be able to provide millions of homeowners across Europe with the financial incentives to help them improve their properties. Now, it's not just talk and reports. Over the last few months, banks whose lending value in their mortgage businesses is a bit greater than 20% of the EU's total GDP have joined this mortgage pilot. They're looking at how to apply these market standards across their entire mortgage businesses. And I was very excited to see today that their explorations are starting to really result in them launching big products. Just today, there was an announcement that BNP Paribas, one of the largest banks in the world, E.ON, one of the largest green utilities in Europe, are partnering to launch a new mass consumer product the green mortgages. Now, I want to move to another trend. And there's a bit of a call to action in this one, because when we start to look at the total carbon impact of our built environment, I think this is an area where you, the Norwegian market, can really lead the world. Because of your unique energy mix, because of the carbon profile of your buildings, this is something that some of your leading actors have been looking at for some time. And we know that whilst the world is tackling operational emissions through these net zero programs, the embodied picture needs to come into the picture in much sharper focus. As we move towards net zero, the carbon profile of our buildings will, of course, be increasingly down to the embodied carbon. And there's great work going on across the world today this is taken from a report that the Finnish government is funding from Bionova. It will be released very soon. There are certification systems and regulatory systems that are looking at this total carbon picture and particularly that embodied part. But all this great work is not resulting in visible industry and political action at a global level. And with 11% of total CO2 emissions resting here, and the need to make action much more visible because that's rising at a rate of 1%. We need to take action. So we've come together with a number of business and city networks to actually, just this week, launch a project with the Green Building Councils to start to bring together all that great work that's been done on both demand and supply side to tackle this issue to a much more visible political and industry level, to set out a ro roadmap. And indeed, this was one of the first places we looked. We know our colleagues at the Norwegian Green Building Council and their industry leaders have been looking at this issue for some time. And so we are looking to you for global leadership on this issue. It's heavily connected to a theme I was delighted to hear about, the circular economy. This is the next big one. It's exploding as a hot topic across the world, in fact, not just in my own region of Europe, but Europe is all in. The EU has framed this environmental agenda as, one, as key to its economic agenda for the future. 
and it's brought in at the very highest level. The European Commission has released its first ever circular economy tool for building performance assessment levels, which is being tested now by about 150 projects across the region to say we need to understand how we approach radical resource efficiency and look at the full life cycle of our sector. And the EU is all in because of the huge opportunities here globally. Some people haven't heard this, but China for, for many years now, at the highest political level, has been bought in to the circular economy. It is an economy that's seen great growth and it's extremely resource intensive. And there are huge opportunities for dialogue. Yerika Tainan, the commissioner, was at an event with us just the other day, saying, we're going to China, please come to us with ideas, show us how European enterprise is leading on the, construction, on the circular economy for construction. And to look again at another report that was released just a few days ago by our Dutch Green Building Council colleagues on a framework for circular buildings. Actors, and it's great to hear that similar efforts are going on here, are looking to very specifically define what does the circular economy mean for the building sector. Our Dutch colleagues have created this strategic framework, looking at the key design aspects that need to be considered for, us, uh, for circular construction. And for their tool, their certification tool, BRIAM, a tool that's used very prevalently here in this market, they've looked at what are the areas we need to start to optimize and work on to ensure that BRIAM is truly responding to a circular economy. Myself and colleagues were very lucky recently to be in Amsterdam at the Circle Building. This is a building that's owned by a bank. It's a pavilion, an events pavilion for ABN AMRA, one of the Netherlands' foremost sustain sustainable investors. And when it was originally conceived, they had planned it to just be your average swanky, flashy bank event venue. And then the architect said, no, hang on. The Netherlands is moving at the highest political levels now towards a circular economy. It has very ambitious goals. And we as a bank need to look at how do we take advantage of that opportunity. So let's learn. And they created a building which from the very design phase looked at how it would be deconstructed at the end of its life. They crowdsourced things like ceiling insulation by actually asking their employees to donate old jeans. So 16,000 pairs of Avian AMRO employee jeans ended up in, in ceiling insulation in this project. We've heard about products as services, so the lifts, the lighting, is actually offered as a service. So is, is, is retained by the manufacturer. And this was a key point. AB and AMRO would be the first to say, financing, when we're looking at shifting towards leasing and service models, is such a key consideration. And the banks in many countries aren't often in the room when we're talking circular construction. And they need to be. So people are starting to make a reality of this. But going truly circular, as our colleague said, is going to require a radical rethink. And I'll touch, as my last theme, on what I'm delighted to, to introduce uh, Dr. Whitney Austin Gray on in just a moment, health and well-being. This has, for many of us, always been at the center of our movement. Buildings are for the people in them. But until recently, we hadn't realized what a powerful tool they are in driving the case for better buildings. And we talk a lot about the 90% rule, for many years, I tried to convince people energy efficiency in buildings is so necessary because if you reduce your energy bill by 50%, there are big paybacks. So if I'm a CFO of an office-based business, I look at that and I say, well, 1% of my total costs are energy costs. So yeah, okay, 50% reductions of 1%, okay, but I'm not, not that interested. But if you go to a CFO and you say, I can improve employee productivity, by 3%, 4%, 5%, the CFO goes, oh, OK, when 90% of their running costs are staff. And there is a win-win here between sustainable building performance and people performance, the metrics that businesses are using to actually judge their success or their failure. So with our partners, the GBCs, and a number of global sponsors, we've been leading a campaign of thought leadership over the last few years, bringing together leading projects, leading research efforts in this area, to start to tell that picture about what is that link between a sustainable office and employee productivity, between a sustainable retail mall 
and the footfall, how that converts into revenue for those who rent in it. And we're trying to crack the really difficult one, which is homes. Because in offices and retail, we found so much of the data is already there. You have the building performance people, the facility managers who have building performance data. You have the HR managers who have that people performance data. And the CFO, the finance department, who have bottom, uh, bottom line data on the company's financial performance. So it's just bringing together that data. But we think if we're able to tell this story to citizens, who are, of course, deeply concerned about their health, their well-being, if we're able to show them the difference that sustainable buildings can make here, we'll have tapped into a really powerful driver for demand. I want to share a couple of very quick projects, some of my favorites here, that actually spell out how companies are starting to make that link between building environmental performance and people performance. So this is an example of a refurbishment project in El Salvador. So the usual green features, things like better lighting, indoor air quality, and so on. But importantly here, they looked at actually how does this change the picture in terms of occupant satisfaction? And then looking at financial metrics, such as absenteeism, which saw a 44% drop, what does that mean for the business in terms of its bottom line? And here, it's an $85,000 benefit each year. Again, this data's there, but we're not tapping into it enough. A company that's been very smart in doing this is Sangoban, one of our partners. This is a living laboratory, one of their, their, their headquarter buildings in the US, that introduced all sorts of different health and well-being strategies, improved daylighting, attractive stairwells, uh, various products that helped improve indoor air quality. They have a, a gypsum wall board that helps take formaldehyde out of the atmosphere. But what they did is not just look at the performance of their products, in environmental terms, they link that to people performance. So this is a call center in that building where they saw that the sales leads that employees generated doubled when they moved into this new buildings. So productivity, the, the people who are at the heart of generating sales for the business, their productivity doubled. This is, for us, we feel an incredibly powerful business driver for the better buildings that we want, that our UN SDGs require of us, and that we must now move towards over the next 12 years if we're to meet the goals of our Paris Agreement. Now, I'm delighted for some more of this exciting megatrend to hand over to Dr. Whitney Austin Gray from Delos, who will be opening the box and telling you some more. <laughs>